This first video provides an introduction to the data site metadata schema. In this first section, we'll provide some context for what the data site metadata schema is. But first, let's take a step back. What is metadata? You may have heard metadata defined as data about data or data that provides information about other data. Metadata is not the content of the data itself, but it helps us to understand the structure, nature, and context of the data. For data site DOIs, data site DOI metadata provides information about the relevant resource or the thing for which you are registering a DOI, for example, a data set. When a data site member registers a DOI, they always register metadata about the resource. This helps with improving discoverability, connectedness, and overall fairness. The data site metadata schema is specifically designed for data site DOIs. It consists of a list of core metadata properties. These have been chosen for accurate and consistent identification of a resource for citation and retrieval purposes. Each property is documented with recommended use instructions. The schema provides standardization for data site DOI metadata, enabling users to search across data site DOIs and thereby increasing interoperability. The schema is developed by the Data Site Metadata Working Group, which is a group of volunteers who work in collaboration with data site staff. The schema can be found on the website schema.datasite.org, which includes the official documentation, the XML schema, and various examples. And the schema is updated about every one to two years. The Data Site Metadata Working Group who develop the schema consists of 10 to 16 community members and some data site staff members. The group is chaired by two representatives of member organizations. Members collaborate on schema changes and meet monthly. When there are available seats, there is an open call for nominations at the end of the calendar year. If you're interested in seeing changes to the data site metadata schema, the best way you can do that is to contribute suggestions. Each suggestion is reviewed by the data site team and goes through a prioritization process before reaching the metadata working group. When suggestions are prioritized, we encourage community discussion around the suggestion. The metadata working group discusses the changes and agrees on a proposal, and we share those proposed changes with the community for feedback. You can learn more about the process at the link on this slide, including how to suggest changes. A group of changes is released together as a new schema version approximately every one to two years. Each schema version is either a major version or a minor version. The most recent major version as of April 2023 is schema four, and the most recent minor version is 4.4. Minor versions do not contain breaking changes, but major versions do contain breaking changes which are not backwards compatible. For example, Schema 4.5 is a minor version that will not contain breaking changes, but the up upcoming Schema 5.0 will have breaking changes. At some point after releasing Schema 5, we will also work towards discontinuing support for Schema 3. Let's now look at the structure of the data site metadata schema, including the required, recommended, and optional properties. The schema has 20 top-level metadata properties, which are sometimes called fields or elements. There is a hierarchical structure here where some of these properties have sub-properties. Some of the properties are mandatory, whereas others are recommended or optional. Some can be repeated, and some have control list values where the property is restricted to a certain set of values. Of the 20 metadata properties, six of them are mandatory. These are identifier, which is the DOI, creator, title, publisher, publication year, and resource type. Six are recommended, which means they typically apply and should be included wherever possible. And eight are optional, which means they don't always apply, but should still be included when available. Many of these properties have sub-properties. And like the 20 top-level properties, these sub-properties can be mandatory or optional, some have their own sub-properties, and some are repeatable while some are not. The data site metadata schema is primarily represented in XML format. 
And when we translate this property and subproperty structure to XML, properties are represented as elements. Subproperties can be either sub-elements, which are nested within an element, or attributes attached to an element. In this example, we have a creator property, which is an element. It has a sub-element, creator name, and then the creator name has an attribute for the name type. This example shows just the six mandatory properties which is the minimal metadata that has to be included to register a findable DOI. You can see here the identifier, creator, title, publisher, publication year, and resource type, which has a resource type general attribute, a mandatory attribute. The metadata schema is generic, and it supports a variety of resource types from all disciplines. Here is the current list of values that can be used for the resource type general attribute, and this is a controlled list. Here we can see that there are a variety of types, including but not limited to datasets. You can use the dataset metadata schema for text-based resources like preprints and conference papers, as well as other types of resources like software and physical objects. You can really represent any type of resource. Of course, there are many more properties that can be included beyond the mandatory six. And we'll highlight just a couple of the recommended properties that are particularly important. Let's first turn to the subject property, which can be used for any subject, keyword, classification code, or key phrase describing the resource. Subjects are critical for discovery and help to contextualize resources. There are a few optional sub properties that are helpful to include here, when using a control vocabulary or classification scheme. For example, with a Library of Congress subject heading, that would be the classification scheme, and then you would include the link to the authority record in the value URI field. Another important property that goes hand in hand with subject is description. This is useful for discovery as well, and also you can use the description to include any additional information that doesn't fit elsewhere in the schema. There are several different types of description, and this can be indicated using the mandatory description type subproperty. For example, abstract, methods, or technical information. The last recommended property we'll look at in this video is related identifier. Related identifier is used for identifiers of related resources. There are two mandatory subproperties for related identifier. There's the relation type, which indicates the type of relationship. For example, that the GOI is cited by the related resource or that it cites the related resource. Relation types can also represent versioning, whole part relationships, and other specific types of relationships. There's also the related identifier type, which is for the type of identifier itself, which could be a DOI or a URL, for example. In this video, we learned that metadata helps us to understand the structure, nature, and context of the resource. We also looked at why and how the dataset metadata schema is developed, including how you can get involved and contribute to the schema. We also learned about the structure of the metadata schema, including its 20 metadata properties, six of which are mandatory, and how each property has various sub-properties. Now that we've looked at the basics of the schema, let's see how this metadata gets into data site systems and what happens to metadata when a DOI is registered and metadata is provided to data site. When you register a DOI, that DOI's metadata goes on a journey. It starts with DOI registration, indexing in data site systems, and several processing steps. And then from the metadata consumer side, metadata is retrieved and made available for discovery. First, metadata is registered, and there are several DUI registration methods. All of these methods can be used to provide metadata to data site. They're just different ways of registering a DUI and sharing the same information. You can create a DUI using the Datasite Fabrica web interface through the web form, or you can upload a metadata file via Fabrica, usually an XML file. Datasite also has two APIs for registering DUIs. The REST API and the MDS API. Repository platforms use these APIs for their data site integrations, 
And it's also possible for anyone with a data site repository account to use the APIs directly and build their own integration. The REST API mainly accepts JSON format and the older MDS API accept, accepts XML files. However, you can also submit XML and other formats via the data set REST API using an encoding format called Base64. No matter which method you choose to register a DOI, the metadata will go through the same process. When you register a DOI, the metadata is included in what we call the data site metadata store. Metadata for findable DOIs is then indexed, so it can be retrieved by users of data sites APIs and services. When a DOI is created or metadata is updated, we also process it for data site event data. Event data is a joint service by data site and Crossref to collect and expose links to DOIs. For data site DOIs, events are created for the related identifier property, for creators with ORCID IDs, for creators with affiliations as BOR IDs, and for funders with Crossref funder IDs. In addition, some types of events are counted. We count citations of a DOI and references to other DOIs. We count versions from the has version and is version of relation types. And we count parts from has part and is part of. These counts are available through the REST API and citations and references are also visible through Data Site Commons, our discovery interface. It's important to note that this processing does not change the DOI metadata itself. Event data is built using DOI metadata in order to enable additional services. Data site metadata is retrievable through our APIs and services. And these services include our public APIs, like the data site REST API, the data site GraphQL API, which is used by our search interface data site commons, and our OAIPMH service, which is mainly used by harvesters. There is also DOI content negotiation which enables metadata retrieval in several different formats, including schema.org and JATS. The main goal of all of this metadata is to improve discoverability. Data site metadata is findable and accessible, and everything is openly available in the public domain or CC0. One place where you can discover data site DOI metadata is Data Site Commons, our search interface. In addition, external metadata aggregators use our REST API or our OAIPMH service to harvest all of our DOIs or a subset of DOIs for inclusion in other search interfaces, for example, OpenAir and Clarivate's Data Citation Index. Through these platforms, you can also discover resources thanks to data site DOI metadata. Registering a data site DOI makes metadata more discoverable. After data site DOI metadata is registered, the metadata is indexed in data sites metadata store and undergoes processing for services like event data. Metadata is made available for retrieval through data sites APIs, which are used for discovery services, including data site commons and various metadata aggregators. <laughs>